Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. You've got your host, Derek Lambert, and co-host, Dr. Luther G. Williams. I am super excited about this show here. We're going to be delving into an amazing, amazing guest. And, uh, you know, he has he's such a busy man. It was a blessing to even get him here on the show. Uh, if you like what you're hearing with this show, please be partners with us. Go down in the description. Check out ways to help us out. Honestly, it always helps us out so that we can keep this thing going. We believe in what we're doing. Luther, I'm not going to waste any more time. Please catapult us into the next seg segment of the show. A strap on tight, Derek, because our guest is Tim Freak, a pioneering philosopher whose best-selling books, inspirational talks, life-changing retreats, and transformative training programs have touched the hearts and minds of many, many, many people around the globe. He's the author of some 35 books translated into more than 15 languages, including The Jesus Mysteries, which was a top six Amazon bestseller and Daily Telegraph book of the year. We talked all about that in our first show with Tim. This is a continuation of his time with us. And in his two most recent books, Deep Awake and Soul Story, Tim offers a revolutionary approach to awakening for the 21st century and a visionary new understanding of the nation of the nature of reality. I always like to say Tim is all about the equation truth plus transparency plus traction equals transformation. He gets traction on issues uh, way beyond what you'll see ordinary scholars deal with. I mean, it's not just intellectual. He puts this into action. You know, I say, you know, that uh, Tim is to scholarship sort of what Groucho Marx said. I'd never want to join a club that would have me as a member. So he's way <laughs> beyond just ordinary scholarship now. Uh, so, Tim, wonderful to have you back for the second half. It's great to be here. Yeah, I really enjoyed the last one. I'm sure we're going to enjoy this one, too. Oh, great, great. You know, in your book, The Jesus Mysteries, you show that uh, for the Gnostics, Jesus must be understood on many different levels. And so uh, that's kind of the religious side. But then on the physical side of things, we have frontier science. And many people are kind of approaching the same types of issues from a scientific background. They're recognizing that reality is fluid. It's vibratory. It is quantum. Uh, you, you travel all around the world. Do you find that religion and science are coming together today in a way that we've been waiting for? Yes and no. <laughs> um, uh -oh. I, uh, yes, because I think people really want it to happen. Uh, certain people do. Excuse me, I'm steaming up with excitement as I'm talking to you. Let me just clean my glasses. Um, the, I think there is, is a lot of really good attempts to try and bring science and spirituality together. There's a lot of people on both sides that don't want that to happen. And there's a growing group in the middle who do. Speaking personally, I think there is a huge shift in our understanding coming. And it will be a shift which enables us to understand both the physical causal nature of reality and also the soul dimension of reality, which spirituality has always been about and how they relate. And when we get there, and I think it is coming, uh, I think it will be a, as big a shift for human culture as the emergence of science was three, four hundred years ago. I think it will be enormous. Are we there yet? No. And it's because it's actually very difficult to bring science and spirituality together. And that's why it's been my focus for the, for the last period of my life. It's been like, ah, how can, how can we genuinely bring this together? And, and personally, I think some of the attempts that's being made at the moment through quantum physics and things like that, 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 for reasons I can share, I don't think they really work. I think what's happening is that science is being misappropriated and interpreted in a way that no physicist would agree with. On the one hand, in order to fit it into spirituality, or on the other hand, spirituality is being really diminished. So it's now just about oneness and entanglement. Well, it is about that, but it's about also the immortality of the soul, for instance, and the, and the way that synchronicity happens or, or magical events. It's like, well, how does that fit in with physics? That's really hard. So my passion and what my last book, Soul Story, was about is I feel we can bring these two together and the secret is an evolutionary understanding, which includes both, which I can explore 
as much as you want with you. But I think that's my answer to the, to the question. It's interesting you say that, Tim, because I personally, and, and this is, you know, when one thing after another uh, keeps popping up, it's like the universe is talking to you, you know? And I recently have had this discussion in, in recent Facebook groups talking about dreams. And like one lady, I guess, was speaking to a person who actually does not believe in any anything like that uh, of the sort of knowing something before it happened type of revelatory experiences like that. I personally, and this is just me, I personally don't believe people's arms come back that don't exist. I don't believe dead corpses come back from the dead. I don't believe personally in those type of uh, uh, experiences. That's just me based off of my experience and what I've observed and what I've experienced. But I do, however, believe that there are these strange what we like to call coincidences that do not ever seem coincidental. Um, it's like they happen exactly when, and there's consecutive things that continuously happen in my life that to say it's my brain having a fart, it just doesn't make sense to me. And so those are the things that when people ask me, well, it seems you're somewhat naturalistic, but you're somewhat not. Um, I try to tell them, what if there's an energy force, some metaphysical misunderstanding we're not aware of in our evolution of thought, and we're not able to pin down what that is, and people are calling that spirituality, but in the scientific world, we aren't able to say what it is, and here they are meeting together, and we're able as humans to tap into that, and therefore, it's like answering prayers, if you will, where there's power of conscious awareness that humans are able to have that make these things come true. Almost like we're drawing them in from the ether. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have an experience on that? I, like, yeah, definitely. Most of the people I know experience life as very paradoxical. On the one hand, it's very cause and effect. If you drop something, it falls. And most of life, you can approach in that way. But then from time to time, magic happens. From time to time, things have synchronicities, to use Carl Jung and, and Pauli's term. That the, the suddenly life's like a dream. Hang on, this is like a dream. I mean, I, I'm coming to um, to America in March uh, to do a number of events, including speak at TED, and I want to talk about this. Um, so I've just been you know, I've just been thinking about this. I re was remembering a synchronicity, which is particularly relevant to us, given that we're talking about Gnostic. Um, when I was quite young, and I was sitting on my bed, and I was meditating with my eyes closed on the figure of Osiris, the Egyptian god which we were studying at the time. And above my head, there was this uh, shelf, which I, I, I built the shelf myself. I'm really bad at DIY, so it wobbled. And every day at 11 o'clock, because I was living in a cheap part of town in an attic, this, this concrete train would go past and the whole house would shudder. And I'm there sitting meditating and the train goes past and this huge book comes and falls in front of me and opens up as if I was reading it. Uh, now, the book falling was causality. The train went past, I built the shelves, they wobbled, it fell. Okay. But something else was going on, because, what, because that particular book wasn't any book. It was Mysterium Conjunctionis by Carl Jung, the guy who coined the name Synchronicity, and it opened on a page in which he was discussing Osiris that I had just been meditating on. Now, if, an, if that happens to you enough, and God knows it's happened to me so many times I've forgotten them all, then it, there's a phenomena there, which if you're a curious person, you go, I want to understand. So I think most of us experience life as, as a magical story. Not always magical, but sometimes. There is a dreamlike dreamlike to life, and there's also a non-dreamlike dimension to life. And I think there's these, it's because there are two realms interacting. And we're experiencing those two realms all the time. They're the realm of the body and the realm of the soul or the psyche. One is the imagination. It is a dream. We're in a dream right now. We're having thoughts. There's no thoughts in the world. There's no images in the world. There's no meaning in the world. I love that. You know, it's like one of the things I love to do. And your viewers can do this at the same time as you do. It's just, if you look at me, what you're actually seeing in the world is a monkey wearing clothes making funny noises. That's what's in the world. But what's happening in soul, in your psyche, is you're hearing meaning. But there's no meaning in the sound waves. The meaning is all in this non-material dimension. So this non-material dimension, which is a dream, 
which is all about narrative and story, is interacting with this material causal dimension. And they're interacting all the time. And I think that's what we need to understand. Now, the problem with science, well, we got science, you said about bringing science to spirituality. The problem with spirituality is it ignores the causality. It's all magic, it's the secret. Just dream it and it will happen. Well, you know what? Sometimes the magic works and sometimes it don't. Because it's not quite like that. There's a, there's, you know, the, light, the world is causal. And that's, it's not just a dream. There's a difference between dreams and causality. But they do interact. So that's what, so science is, so spirituality is going, it's just this one. And then science is doing the opposite. It's going, no, it's just this one. I mean, the analogy I love for science is, it feels like, science is like giving someone a DVD of a film and going, hey, what do you make of this? And then coming back the next day saying, well, I've looked at it carefully and it's digital information encoded on a disc which projects pixels on a screen. And you go, yeah, I know, that's true, but what did you think <laughs> of the story? Because <laughs> that's the bit we're really interested in. Oh, man. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, look. This is good, this is good. <laughs> this is fantastic, fantastic. Okay, now I want to go back to the Bible of all places and reread the story of Moses and the burning bush as maybe an invitation to act on a potentiality. The burning bush uh, aroused Moses' curiosity, so here he gets a, ch a chance to... Uh, to reflect his particular perspective on the universe. I, I, I mean, I'm thinking about all sorts of things, Tim, based on what you're saying. Um, so anyway, let's, let's go back to your life. 1959, you're born uh, into a set of specific circumstances as your wave function collapses. How did, how, how did, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. You became real. I'm glad we're sharing this dimension. How did the circumstances of your birth prepare you for your life's work? I want you to reflect a, a bit on that. You didn't have control over any of that stuff. How do you see that as having prepared you for what you are doing now and what you are about to do? Well, I was born in a very nondescript little town in the southwest of England. Um, and I think it was so boring, I, I had to make life interesting. Uh, and it was full of people like that. So I met, one of them was Peter Gandhi, who I met as a boy, who I went on to write the Jesus Mysteries with. And Peter and I met in that time and we went through all sorts of adventures, did every mad thing you could imagine to play with consciousness um, together. So that's one of the things. I think the other things about, you know, this is an interesting question I don't normally get asked. And I think the role that my parents played was huge. My, my parents were ran a small business, a small hairdressing business. Um, they were wearing, my, they, were, they loved culture, but they were not intellectuals by any stretch. Um, They're smart. But what they really had was an interesting polarity, because I think my, 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 I thought just the other day, my dad's thing he would say to me over and over again all the time was, Timothy, stop and think. <laughs> and I thought, I've just embedded that in me, this kind of like, whoa, before you just believe something or you do something, stop and think. And my mum, although she never said it, what she was in her very being was stop and love. That's what she was. She was just this being of love. I don't know. She had the Gnosis. I have no idea how she had the Gnosis. She didn't read any books particularly. She's very smart. She didn't read books particularly. She read my books, but that's because they were by me. She had read my books if they were on train spotting. She wasn't really into philosophy, any of this stuff, but she just knew. She knew that deep oneness and that love. So I had this very interesting polarity of this stop and think and stop and love. And I think that's given me this whole, what I call this paralogical understanding of it's not either or, it's both and. So it's both. So for me, it's very much about the head and the heart. It's both. How could you not have both? So it's very much about being, waking up to the oneness, but also it's about endorsing the individual. It's always both and science and spirituality. It's not one or the other, it's both. And it's not the sp spiritual realm creating matter when it's not matter just on its own, it's both. It's both. So I think that was, that was all there. What an interesting question. That is a good, good answer. And I feel like I'd love to touch on the whole female and mothers and, and wives and 
they know they have a sense they can tap into seems much better than we do. I mean, for 12 years, my wife, when I first married her and I was extremely religious, I mean, I was like diehard Bible thumping, you know, fundamentalist Christian. And she's like, men wrote this, honey. You do know, like, <laughs> like, you know, and I was thinking she was the opposite of me, but she was saying, no, there's truth to it, but you're taking this thing way too far. You don't understand. Years later, when I researched, of course, I came to some actual answers in this causal world. And it was like, you know what? Uh, I found out some things. She goes, I told you, you know, I already told you. And I was like, well, how would you know? You didn't study. And she's just like, my, my gut had told me that something wasn't right about what you were, you know, where you were at. So it's really strange how women know these things. But I wanted to take this gnosis to a different place, if you don't mind, because you've traveled across the world exploring, teaching. You found significant groups, I suspect, of Gnostics um, that may still exist or have gone underground. What can we do to rebuild this Gnostic network? And are there, are there some Gnostic groups out there that you've encountered that were like, wow, they're onto some stuff. Can you go into some of that, maybe? Uh, yeah, they do exist. I can't really go into it because they're still mostly secret, um, which I don't think they need to be anymore. I mean, one must remember that the secret societies were secret because you were liable to die. Um, some of them are still in cultures where that's true. And I think that's why some of them are still secret, because especially in the Islamic cultures and some of those places, uh, it's still quite dangerous. Um, and they're deep and profound and amazing people. And, and I've been very privileged to, to meet them and, and, and learn with them and see them but um, personally you know I don't think that is the way to go or not for me and when I first did the Jesus Mysteries I had a lot of people going you're gonna set up a Gnostic church <laughs> it's like oh no not more more bishops <laughs> it's like that's not for me <laughs> um, I think what I what I'm interested in is a new form of Gnosticism um, which where which which really brings it into the 21st century and um, and that and, and and even calling it gnosticism is probably a distraction it's about getting this gnosis and being able to say it clearly and have practices where you can experience it for yourself so my my favorite thing um guys is when i can get together like i'm going to in june at the, at the omega institute for instance with 20 30 40 people and go right let's you let's let's really look at who we are and what this is and so deeply let's relax let's enjoy ourselves and my intention will be that everyone experiences the gnosis and feels the big love feels the agape in every cell of their body in such a way they can't possibly miss it because that's what we need and then we need to take it out and share it and keep building it and come back to it because you'll forget because it's hard to remember because it's so big it's hard but you can, and you can keep returning to it. And, you know, I remember more than I did. And that's because I keep returning to it. And so that's my real passion is let's, 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 let's create a new, new Gnosticism and let's create a Gnosticism which can actually be in harmony with science because science truly is amazing. But it's, but it's narrow, like we discussed. So let's open science up and bring the two together. The words, uh, song, dance, harmony, or just a little light peppering through what you say. Uh, Tim, what's your favorite song? What, uh, what's your favorite uh, lyric? I guess that would, be, that would be something to consider. And then maybe your favorite music. Oh God, I love music so much, Luther. I used to be a musician before as a writer because music's the biggest magic I know. I wanted to change people's consciousness and it felt like, well, nothing does it like music. I just make music. So from the age of about 15 um, onwards, right until my early thirties, I was making music, writing music, performing, recording studios, recording studios, all of that stuff. So I love, I really love music. And I use a lot of music at my retreats because it's so transformative. So when I give people big experiences, often I'll have music there as well so that they can have that. My favorite pieces, oh Jesus, how can you possibly say? But the, and my lyrics, I love, but I mean, but one of the lyrics that was, was, which, was, which came into my mind when you said it, so his one, was from One by U2, where um, uh, Bono sings, um, we are one, but we're not the same. 
we get to carry each other, carry each other. And I just always well up every time I hear that, those lines. We're one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. I just think that is so deep. That's it. That's the Gnosis. That's it. Mm, I love music too. And uh, Luther and I sometimes will sit there for hours and just jam. <laughs> and we'll just jam and enjoy each other's presence and talk and uh, be funny, you know, just be us. And so s s about you, because I find your story fascinating. I could relate to you so much on so many levels. Um, what was the aha to all of this? When was the, when were you, when did you really wake up? Uh, there's a story about when you were 12. Is that when it happened? When you had this, rebirth concept idea what they would call being born again or, or or being waking up or from the slumber what what was that aha and how did that happen can you go a little bit into that yeah i think it started the first one i mean there's been lots of them um and i hope there'll be more but um there's a lot of waking up to be done the uh, it started though when, when i was 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 12 almost 13 and I'd always found life deeply mysterious, always. And it always felt like I'm alive and my job is to find out why, and I will. <laughs> and I can remember my dad saying to me, going for walks with him and him saying, better men than you and me, Timothy, have asked these questions and found no answers. And I remember thinking, but I will, because how could there be such a big question if there wasn't such a big answer? That's ridiculous. And so it was already there, that kind of, arrogance really youthful arrogance and um and then one day just sitting on this hill overlooking the sleepy town uh, sitting with the mystery and the, the big questions something happened and it was the first time uh, it certainly was the first time i'd ever experienced it since i was you know old enough to remember remember this incredible oneness the biggest thing i remember is the love um and i remember it well but i also wrote about it straight away after i've got things i wrote um about the experience, so I, I've got a record, and this enormous love, like everything is just full of love. And so there was a huge feeling of, oh my God, I've, I've found the answer I was looking for, but it turns out to be not in words. It turns out that the answer is actually an experience. So that idea that I would later discover as Gnosis, hear about as Gnosis, was, was already there. It was like, oh. So when I came across the Gnosis, oh God, and the Agape, it's like, I know, this, I know what this is. Um, and also in between, I've been, just giving up as much time as I could to learning about finding people who knew what I was talking about. And that's why I studied the spiritual traditions of the world and went through them and going, oh, here's a guy talking about oneness and love in China, 500 BC. Oh, here's someone talking about it in the Sufi tradition in Islam. Oh, here's someone in the Zen Buddhist tradition. And they're all different. They're all like us. They're individuals. They've got certain qualities that the others lack and vice versa. But, but there's a similarity. There's a common human experience. Um, and then that started off the journey and then it's just carried on ever since. And there's been periods where I've kind of felt confused and lost and then periods where I've come through to another level. And that seems to be the dialectic, the conversation of, of awakening, which happens to me and seems to happen to, to everyone who goes on this path. And, and, we and, meet you, each other. and Tim, you keep that conversation going. And one of the things I admire most about your work is your transparency. Do you, do you ever, yeah, you don't have to talk about it, but I don't know if, if you, if you do, but uh, that's what's really amazing. The fact that you're so real and that all of us can identify at some level with your experiences. So you're 12 years old and, and, and already you're using mass media to communicate this love that you're feeling because you wrote a play. I uh, did. I, be, I, be, I believe it was called The Wrong Way. It was. What, 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 okay, so 12 years old, come on, Tim, what was it like to birth that into the world? At, at such well, an age. I was, by the time I did the play, I was 13. Um, not that much difference. And it was, I, again, I look back and I think, God, you know, I'm almost 60. You know, you said I was born in 59, almost 60 in a few months. So I've been looking back on my life and thinking, wow, what, who was that little kid? And, and I think he, he was amazing and, 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 and I love him, but he was also probably a bit irritating and precocious and full of himself. Um, and there was just this enormous self-confidence I wrote the play, it was about going through the whole of history, about the, that we've done things in the wrong way, because we've all been full of hate and war, and it had this kind of Gnostic Christian figure, Christ figure coming through, suggesting we did it in a different way. 
and it was outrageous. It was done in a church which had been transformed uh, into a theatre. It had swearing in because it had a it had a, a a scene which was in Northern Ireland, which was there was the troubles at the time, and so the yes, scene was yeah. in the top. There was a lot, of, and I put in swearing. So it was all done by kids. So everyone under fifteen swearing in church. Uh, the TV cameras turned up. It was like, and, the, and it was packed, absolutely packed for night after night after <laughs> night. Um, and and I was there, this kid just telling all of these adults what to do with the lights, and I want this and do this, and <laughs> and I think Jesus, they must have looked at me and thought, who is this kid? This is, you know, <laughs> get a grip. <laughs> but somehow, uh, you know, and how much of that came from just my own confidence and arrogance or whatever it was and how much of that came from the experience I'd had and the feeling of this really mattered um but right from the start it felt about communication let's get this out there you know Tim you've you've talked about um like well let's just put it this way life seems scary okay and we become obsessed with trying to protect ourselves and I'm actually personally going through counseling at this moment in my own life. And uh, I find it very useful because one of the methods that she makes me do, she goes, I want you to look at yourself from a different perspective. Like you're not kind of like what you talked about with going back and behind in our last episode and look at yourself. That's a method that professional medical psychologists and, and such are telling me, this is what I need to do to help me in my life. And I notice I have a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear at the base this. How do you throw off that numbness of life, that fear that, how, how do we deal with those things in your line of research, if you don't mind me asking? Not, not, not at all. So I mentioned earlier, I have this, what I call paralogical approach to things, which is both and rather than either or. And, and that has been a huge help for me. Because if you try and step into a place where you have no fear, I suspect it will be impossible. And you know what? Not even desirable. You know, when people say to me, oh, since I've got involved in spirituality, I just don't experience fear anymore. And my feeling is, wow, you've been not paying attention because life is really scary and bad things happen to good people all the time. And I know there's no reason why they can't happen to me and the people I love. I hope they don't, but they can. So it's intri life is intrinsically frightening, part of it. It's also intrinsically beautiful and, and, and exquisite, but it, it's everything. However, or as well, there is a deep part of me and you, which is completely still and completely safe. It, which is just like present. It's just this very, it's the big love. It's just holding everything just as it is. So my own way is to go, look, don't get rid of the, the problem, but find the other pole. Because then what I find is that there's Tim and sometimes he's scared because life can be scary. And then there's this deep stillness of my being, which is one with everything, which is just holding it. There it is. And then I have both, not one or the other. And that, it feels, is what courage is. So courage isn't not having fear. That's foolhardiness. That's a kind of stupidity. Courage is when you see it as something, and you see that life is scary, but it doesn't overpower you because you have this other pole with you as well. And then you can face the fear and then you can go through it and find the, the, the courage to, to, to live, to engage and to not, not take the route that you mentioned not, of numbness, which is, well, so many of us do because, because we can't, we, you know, we, we can't, it's too much. Does that, does that make sense what I said, Derek? Um, it hits home for me so much. It really does. And I really appreciate that. Because I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that even further in my own walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as as I listen to your path of of expression and uh, just dealing with the circumstances that surround you, I think about my own path, and and at some point I became aware that I had moved beyond this. I don't know. I guess you might call it veil of radical interiority and i came to realize that the world is populated by other beings there are other people here who have the power to affect me which i always knew but also whom i have the power to affect and and i remember in college it was a writing exercise it was an honors english class and i discovered tim that expressing myself is not just an empty exercise but that it's connected to my being directly integrally to who 
I am. And so I started writing in a different way. Uh, and, and, you know, I think of these, I think of these phrases that were unusual. And I'd say, well, no, I never heard anybody say that. And then I gave myself permission to say that. I said, okay, nobody said that before, but that's what I'm feeling in my heart. And I'm going to go ahead and write it. Have you had an experience like that? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's beautifully put, Luther. Yeah, that's you know, we are we that we we experience two realms. We talked about this before. You know, we experience the realm of the body of sensation and the realm of the psyche or soul, which is the imagination. And we bring the imagination. The imagination is heaven, earth and heaven. The imagination is heaven. That's what it is. And hell, it's both. And we bring heaven to earth when we find, we go out into the imagination, we find something beautiful, and then we bring it into the world. And whenever we do that, we bring a bit of heaven to earth. And people have been doing that now so much that as I sit here with you, everything I can see apart from my own body has come through the imagination. Everything. My clothes, I, I'm looking at images of you on a, on a computer screen, the microphone, my glass, everything has been imagined. So we're, br we're bringing the imagination in, I think. That's what we're doing. We're bringing those two worlds together. We imagine how good it can be, and then there's the reality, which is not so good, and then we do our best to transform the physical reality into the idea where it's better. And what a beautiful vision that is. And with writing, God, isn't that a wonderful thing? To have thoughts and then express them. And, and like we're doing now, to, to, to conceptualize ideas and find a way, make these funny noises with our mouths and, and send them across to each other. And then in they come and, ooh, and then the idea arises in another song. And, and with books, it's like the whole thing, but in slow motion. So I can have a thought and then five years later, somebody has that same thought. That I just that I had five years before, and they're getting that thought, that message from me. Hi, there's a message from Tim. And they get to say that, and that's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yes. Gentlemen, it looks like we are running out of time. Luther, would you like to make a last statement comment before we end up talking about how we can get a hold of uh, Mr. Freak's materials? Well, just uh, Tim, uh, having you at this juncture in your life has been a special treat. You make 60 this year, as you've said, and you have entered, uh, you've talked about it on video, in fact, you're in this extraordinary period of personal reflection. You know what I'm talking about. How would you describe it and any very recent insights on where that's going? We'll kind of close with that, but it's a significant period in your life. It really is, Luther, and if anyone wants to, to hear me talk about it, I, I have made a series of three videos over the last 12 months, the last one of which has just been made. It's on YouTube. You can find my YouTube account. It's called The Man Behind the Mask. And what that was inspired by was this feeling of, like everyone, I spend an awful lot of time, you know, I've put my nice jacket on to talk to you guys, look my best, you know, I don't want to have a shave, you know. And that's all good, of course. But... It's, a, it's also like a mask, and it can become a professional mask. You know, I'm an author, 15, 35 books, blah, 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 authority. Blah. And you lose the sense that, yeah, that's all true. But I'm also this guy called Tim. He grew up in the West Country of England. England. He gets scared. He does his best. Some days he's very confused. Some days he's really wise. Um, catch him on a good day if you can. You know, and I, there's things inside him which are amazing and things which are a bit troubling and and I'm on that journey, like everyone else. And, and that's the most important bit. So I wanted to find a way of opening up to that and going, look, hi, it's Tim behind here. <laughs> here's my, here's you know, the scholar, and then hello. <laughs> is, is, there's a guy there. And this last period, as you just said, Luther, has been really transformatory because after my last book, Soul Story, I felt like, oh, I, I, I've achieved something I've set out to do since I was a little boy. So now what? And there was a part of me that felt like I needed to stop. I, I, it's, it takes you, you guys will know it. to do these things takes the most extraordinary amount of effort uh, and determination. It's not easy. It's a, it's a joy, but it's not easy. Um, so I was really wrestling with, do I go forward? Or do I stop? Is it enough? Do I need time for me? I was burning out a bit, exhausted. So I stopped everything. I stopped all my events. So I was just like, whoa, my God, really? Um, and I've had a period of reflection and I'm just about ready now to come back out and launch a whole new thing. 
which I'm calling Univigilism, which is really taking my philosophy to a new level and my work events to a new level, this new Gnosticism, really. Because when I, there's a part of me that would like to just kick back for me, but when I go deep to my intuition, when I listen to God, the message is not yet, not yet. You've got to do this, you've got to carry this through yet. You've, you haven't really started yet. You need to make this another big jump with what you're doing. So I'm going I'm to have a go, do my best. And I'm going to try and coincide it with my 60th birthday. So if any of your listeners are in England, I've invited everyone to my 60th birthday party on the 6th yeah. of, of April because we're going to launch the whole new thing. We'll have a party and we'll dance and we'll, we'll meditate together and gaze together and I'll talk and we'll have fun and we'll raise a glass. So I think there's a whole new phase, Luther. So it's a delight to be here at this moment where I just feel like I'm coming out of hibernation, coming out of withdrawal and just going, yep, I think I'm getting ready for whatever it is next in my little life. And I'm, I just want to do my best to contribute what I can while I can and share the love, share the gnosis, share the wisdom. And, and in the same, and, and by doing that, hopefully make my own journey and become a little bit wiser and more loving myself. Tim, thanks so much for being on the show, for letting us know that you're here. And I'm talking about in the, in the cosmic sense, <laughs> a, as, as well as with this show. Thanks for giving us not just Tim, but also Timothy. I think you know what we mean by that. Uh, and so uh, we, we couldn't ask for more. We're going to love having you in the States. Uh, stateside, he comes, ladies and gentlemen, in March, I believe, right? Yeah, I'm coming to March, uh, Encinitas, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Um, San Francisco, I've got events, uh, Boulder, I've got events, and then in June in the Omega Institute um, near New York. It's all on my website, tinfreak.com. There's loads of free videos, there's books you can look at, there's uh, lots of information. Facebook too, of course. Uh, there's a Tin Freak forum where I discuss ideas with people on Facebook, you can check that out. Uh, and I'm, I'm available, you know, I'm around. Fantastic, fantastic. Tim Freak, ladies and gentlemen. Derek? Thank you so much. And we look forward to maybe having a future uh, podcast or meeting in person and doing an interview ourselves. So who knows? Thank you for joining us so much, Tim. It's been a real delight. Well, in the description, all this stuff will be there for you. Thanks for joining Myth Vision Podcast. Derek Lambert, Dr. Luther G. Williams, and our special guest, Timothy Freak. <laughs>